Charlie Matotoyella with Blue Bear Flutes and of course our website bluebearflutes.com which I hope you have found already instead of somewhere in the middle of this video think I wonder if this guy sells his flutes. Uh, anyway don't forget also to check out our Instagram and I know I've asked so many people people are like I don't use Instagram or I'm not on social media you know and however floats your boat that's fine but I'm gonna tell you you're missing out on some really cool stuff on our Instagram. Don't go to anybody else's just mine and uh, you'll see some of the places we've been, the things we've done, and some of the coolest, uh, you know, I think Native American flutes I personally have ever seen. I'm not saying I haven't seen billions of flutes these days, but, uh, but anyway. So today's video is really uh, something that I have been wanting to do for a long time. It's not something people have asked me to do. A lot of times our videos are about uh, questions that people say, how do you do this and what do you do for that, whether it be flute playing or flute making. Today is kind of a flute playing slash flute buying, maybe buyer's guy, or I don't even know, somewhere down the road there's, there's a lot of it mixed in there into the soup. But uh, what we're gonna be talking about is expectations. And I know immediately it sounds like I'm making this video because I need to manage my customer's expectations. It's not, no. As a matter of fact, it's actually for generally everybody, including people like myself, flute makers, uh, people that buy lots of flutes, people that buy a few flutes. It's about expectations in general, and I just kind of want to give you a, kind of a, I guess, a general idea of what you get and what you buy and what, you know, how it works, what you make. I mean, if you're making uh, flutes as well, and this uh, idea here is one that, you know, I won't say there again, it comes from uh, experiences I've had with my customers. Honestly, I think in 30 or 35 years or so, I've had two customers that picked up a flute and couldn't play it. And they just wouldn't wouldn't play it, I really is what I like to say, but they just were the I can't syndrome. Which I have a video about one of those. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that video, but I'm sure there's a link to it somewhere in the description. Um, but the expectations of what am I getting and what am I, I buying really kind of sums things up. So a lot of people feel like the least expensive flute that they buy, which is usually a small one if it's coming from me, it's a smaller flute. If it's coming from another flute maker, it may be because of their experience. You gotta remember that. So if you're buying a flute based on price, you may not want to set your expectations high if it's coming from an inexperienced flute maker or if it's coming from a mass-produced sweatshop labor flute, you may not want to set your expectations high because even though they may be experienced, their quality control may not be that high. I haven't you know, seen sweatshop labor flutes, uh, except for my, my own sweatshop, which it really is what it feels like sometimes because it gets really hot in our shop, uh, but we don't, we don't have a sweatshop and we make our own flutes just to, to dispel that argument there. Um, but the people that are making those flutes, usually it's not the same person from day to day, week to week. Um, and like I said, they, they have a job. Their job is drilling something out and that's it. And then they have another guy has a job of carving out these totems and that's it. You know, and another guy has a job of shipping them to the U.S. and that's it. And then another guy in the U.S. has a job of buying them and reselling them to you and making you think that they're Native American flutes. Um, that having been said, Keep an eye on what you're paying for and what you're getting. Now, I, having said that, my flutes are usually the least expensive on the web. That's not because um, they're not good quality and not because they're mass produced in some other country or by hundreds of workers or any of that kind of mess. Uh, like I said, it's, it's because I've made a lot of flutes. And some flute makers that have made a lot of flutes um, don't have less expensive prices because either they put a lot of time into their flutes, i.e. lacquer, laser etching, uh, stone inlays, fancy names, uh, they wear a suit and tie when they advertise to you, whatever it is that costs them more money may be something they pass along to you. Um, but uh, when it comes to size of a flute, a lot of flute buyers or people that have expectations about the flute that they're receiving may can only afford something this size, which is kind of a rather general idea. A lot of flute makers, usually the, the ones that make a lot of flutes like myself, um, usually um, make flutes that are smaller, less expensive. It may not be what you believe 
it should cost because it still takes a lot of work making a small flute but it's still less expensive than the larger flutes. And it's typically, typically because of the amount of work and time and everything that goes into it. So if you buy a flute this size, it's not gonna sound like one of my favorite flute players. Yeah, that's, that's really nice. Um, but it's not gonna sound like one of my favorite flute players out there. It's gonna sound a little higher in tone. It's going to sound beautiful in most cases, unless there again you buy it from an inex inexperienced or a sweatshop labor made instrument. Something that is obviously, I mean, it's got signs all over it, don't buy this one. I'm not saying stay away from inexperienced flute makers. If you save that couple of dollars by buying their less expensive flute, you may be helping them to inspire to become a great flute maker. I mean, before you make a bunch of flutes, you have to make one. So that's understandable as well. But uh, keep in mind, that this higher tone, smaller flute is not gonna sound like the lower tone flute that you may have been enjoying in that video we were listening to. Um, so with that in mind, uh, that expectation of the sound of your flute is something that I myself have, have helped out a great deal with, I feel like anyway, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, I'm just saying I try to educate our customers on what they're getting by offering videos. Uh, we have uh, several videos of how each of our flutes sound. Uh, one with a display of a lot of videos on a table and you can hear each of them from like a high D to a low D, including I think even one of our little people flutes which is smaller than this one. Uh, we usually post videos of those on our Instagram because uh, it's just more enjoyable, a shorter amount of time and it's kind of a highlight. A lot of people um, you know, might uh, get a little flute like that and think that sounds really amazing. To me it does. I mean, and I really love the high tone flutes. But um, when you think about what your flute is gonna sound like and you can see what the flute looks like and sounds like and have a reference to, I just figured it helps a buyer to really come across and to pick out what it is that they're looking to buy. I also have a video exactly like that we made years and years ago where my son, who was like 10 at the time, uh, played each of those flutes so you can see what the hand sizes were. And so that's a consideration. And we also have another video um, where it's kind of like the first one I mentioned and I have a, kind of a sheet that you can print out and gives you an idea of the fingerings. Those fingerings are particular to my flutes and their sizes and anybody that makes flutes based on, on uh, my flute patterns. However, they're pretty average. The only difference is they were all five holes instead of having that hole that you have to keep covered all the time for whatever crazy reason. I also have videos about that so make sure you check that out if your expectations are I really have to have a six hole flute but um, I want to play logically you know um, the modern six hole flutes that most people offer you have to keep a hole covered all the time I have videos about why that is um, so you need to know that were all the original six hole flutes uh, played like that no as a matter of fact they weren't None of them, to my knowledge, were played like that up until the Ben Hunt Guide to Indian Arts and Crafts, which was a book written by a mom native that came out a little while back. Um, however, all of our flutes play pretty much the same. They all have the same sound, and even this five-hole flute here can play all the notes of that same six-hole flute. So, you know, looks don't always equate to sound. And that brings me to another thing I'd like to talk about is the price. So... Um, you might think that if my flute doesn't have six holes, it can't play like so-and-so is playing. I can play a silver transverse flute with 22 fingerings and make it sound a lot of ways like this, except for the metal sound, which I can hear and you may not, you may hear it. Uh, but I can make it play and sound like this and play and sound like most other flute players. I can play a four-hole flute, which we offer still today when this video was released four-hole flute, which is a historic example, just like this five is, um, and it um, will play all the same notes. So I can play a four-hole flute and make it sound exactly like your favorite flute player, or this five-hole flute, or modern six-hole flute. You just put a piece of tape over that hole for whatever reason somebody spent the time growing. 
or even my six hole flute, which is a copy of a copy of an original, of original, you know, so, uh, and it plays differently. You don't keep that finger covered up all the time. So, like I said, the looks don't always equate to sound. Um, and sometimes that might be reversed. Sound doesn't always equate to looks. For example, most flute makers, I mentioned earlier, have flutes that are kind of moderately priced. A lot of them are expensive, in my opinion. That's why our prices are lower. That having been said, if you buy a really fancy flute, I have one in my shop. I can't tell you who made it or who sent it to me. Super nice guy that sent it to me. I'm fixing it for him. But he has a beautiful flute that he sent me. It's not the first one I've touched like this. I've, I've repaired $1,000 flutes. Currently, I don't offer a flute that's 1000 bucks. I don't have any intentions of it at this particular time unless inflation and the price of gas and lumber and everything else keeps going up. Uh, but as of today, this day and time, I don't have a flute that costs a thousand dollars. If I wind up having one that costs a thousand dollars, you'd be sure all of my competition's flutes are five and ten thousand um, dollars. But I have worked on a eight thousand dollar flute, and then the one in the shop right now I'm talking about is probably six or eight hundred dollar looking uh, flute. All the fancy inlays, engravings, hand this and whatever that that somebody wants you to believe, which looks like laser etching to me. Uh, nothing's wrong with laser etching. I mean, y'all go for it if you want. Just think about history here. Um, but uh, the price of the flute doesn't always equate to a good sound. So he may pay a lot of money for this flute, but he sent it to me to repair it. A guy that doesn't believe in lacquering, I don't believe in inlaying stones, I don't believe in adding feathers to your flute. And, and I've got a professional flute player right now that's telling me he likes to adorn his own flutes. And that's great. I love hearing that from people. Um, but, I mean, the flute, historically, adorn, I'm not sure how those words go together, but whatever. Uh, historically, they weren't lacquered, weren't laser etched. Few, if any, ever had any kind of etching in them. I've seen one or two historic flutes that, that had some etching in them. Um, some of my favorites were ones made in Mexico that had a little design, like, like this little totem here, that was mounted on it somewhere, and that's just too cool to me to see something like that. A lot of times it's of a deity or a special animal or sometimes even a person. Um, we have some videos coming out in the very near future. There's a little flute in there I'm thinking of that has, um, actually it's a guy, the flute is a man playing the flute and you blow and his head's antique. I mean, I don't even know how to call it an antique. It's a historical, it's 12, 1500 years old. It's before the invasion. Really beautiful, beautiful flute. So. Um, the cost doesn't necessarily determine what you get. Like I said, my flute's not lacquered, not covered with anything. Have the potential to be a wonderful instrument. And that's the last thing I wanted to touch on uh, with regards to expectations of buying or playing the Native American flute. Um, the one guy that I'm thinking of that I mentioned earlier, which was one of those maybe two people in 30 years that have just decided that they, they gave up on it, they couldn't play the flute. Um, I've spent a lot of time teaching people that they can, not just play the flute, not just make the flute, but really I feel like you can do just about anything. Hopefully positive anything instead of negative anything. But this one person, uh, he just didn't want to want to do it, he just gave up on it. And I think it's because of where he set his expectations and what he perceived his abilities to be. And if you don't understand what that means, or if that just went over your head, or if you just ignored most of what I just said and thought this guy just talks too much, please rewind it and listen to that one more time. Even if you think I'm talking too much, listen to what I said. His expectations were incredibly high, and his perception of his skills and quality of sound, I thought he sounded pretty good for a guy that just, just now picked up the flute. He's been playing for a week. I even told him that when he and I talked on Zoom on my anniversary. You should check out that video. Uh, it's not of him and me, it's me talking about it and opening his, it's called something like unboxing my own flute. But his expectations were that he was going to sound like I just played that flute just now. And I actually got him really close, I felt like, to that level. But he couldn't continually do it on his own without some coaching. And, and I mean, the fact that he did it once is just incredible to me. Because normal uh, first time flute players don't always pick it up and just do everything right the first time. Um, at any point in the first couple of weeks, they don't always do it right the first time. I have heard it happen. As a matter of fact, I've heard a, a kid that 
I'll never forget this little guy. Picked his flute up for the first time, played it a little bit, jumped up on stage at a flute festival the next next weekend, and he was like performing on stage an instant hit. Um, that's great and all. There are things that come with experience and um, you know seasoning, I guess you could say. But uh, but anyway, remember that. And I'm not telling you to set your expectations low. I'm telling you to keep them managed. Manage what you believe you're doing. You might think you absolutely stink at playing the flute. You might. Ask somebody else what they think. Uh, and I know it's going to be embarrassing and you're afraid and whatever, you know. I mean, we all we all have that once in a while, I guess, um, you know, about something. About flute playing, for me, I still get butterflies in my stomach. I've played in front of hundreds of thousands, probably, well, I guess counting, counting YouTube, I'm talking about live, counting YouTube, probably hundreds of millions of people. And uh, I'm not I'm not embarrassed about it. And people will, will say something like "You talk too much," which I've said twice now in this video. I probably don't make videos about talking too much. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, it doesn't it doesn't embarrass me. A lot of times when they make that comment on my videos, I usually make some funny comment, you know, after them. Hopefully, they'll offer some reflection. But uh, but anyway, just like I said, manage your expectations. Manage how critical you are of yourself. Ask others. Uh, does this sound good? Don't ask them, does this sound like this guy over here? Ask them, does this sound good? Because you may be onto something that this guy over here has never even thought of. Uh, I'm, in my classes, my live classes, I've met people just like that. First timers that come up with something that I had never heard before, and I thought that was cool. So anyway, take care. I hope this video finds you all well and gives you some kind of an insight into something pretty cool that you might not have thought about before, or at least not in the way that I wanted to offer it to you. And uh, don't forget to check, check out our other videos. Make sure you share them if you can. I don't always ask people to share my videos, mostly because my sons are both tech junkies and they always say, oh, dad, don't tell people to share your videos. And it's like you're begging them or something. And I'm not begging you, but if you could, that'd be great. It really does help us out. And uh, also, uh, don't forget, if you have a question about Native American flutes, there's a really good chance. If you ask me, I'm gonna tell you this thing I'm very, very known for quoting. I probably have a video on that, so make sure you check those out. Anyway, this is Charlie Montatuyella signing out for Blue Bear Flutes, bluebearflutes.com. Don't forget Blue Bear Flutes on Instagram and TikTok. We'll hope to see you again very soon. Take care.